that's an in-camera reason, Ms. Gurry? That's correct, Your Worship. We are adding in-camera reason number 91A, or K, sorry, of the Community Charter. And that's it, Your Worship. Thank you very much. I'd ask for a procedural motion to proceed in-camera. Move Councillor Thorpe, second Councillor Bonner. All those in favour? Any contrary? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to the December 21st regular meeting of council. I'd like to first recognize that we are on the traditional territory of the Snamic First Nation, that this is the last council meeting of the year, and our CAO advises us we're probably one of the last council meetings anywhere in British Columbia, being such a hardworking bunch, and we just seem to love our meetings. I'd also like to recognize it is the, uh, the winter solstice, as some of the members of council pointed out to me, so we're hopefully going to see a little return of light uh, and as, as the days lengthen. Uh, our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. 
Uh, tonight's regular meeting of council will be held in accordance with the Community Charter Council Procedure Bylaw 2018 number 7272 and Ministerial Order number M192 governing opening meetings during a state of emergency and the Provincial Health Officer Order regarding mass gathering events. Therefore, members of the public are required to observe meetings virtually and not attend in person and question period will be suspended throughout the duration of the Provincial Health Orders in effect. The first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items. Ms. Gurry, please. Thank you, Worship. Agenda item 12G, development permit application number DP1174 for 2535 Bowen Road. We're replacing attachment G and adding delegations from Raymond Debleed, Architect Inc. and Patrick Brandreth, Nanaimo Honda. However, they're just here if Council has any questions. They aren't actually wishing to speak this evening. Agenda item 12H, development permit application number DP1192 for 4851 Cedar Ridge Place, adding delegations from Raymond DeBleed, Architect Inc., and Chris Lundy, Westmark Construction. And again, they're just here if Council has any question regarding that um, development permit application. They um, don't wish to actually speak. And that's it from me, Your Worship. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Gurry. I, I just want to say there appears to be a typo in here. Uh, Mr. DeBeal doesn't want to bleed for his application. DeBeal, thank you. I was I was wondering about that. My apologies. Councillor Hemmons, I believe there's one item you... Uh... Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I would like to ensure that the correspondence received by members of the Homeless Coalition is um, added to the agenda, and then I have a, a motion relating to such under new business. So, Your Worship, um, if there could be a seconder for that late item, and then you can vote on that before the other items. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, seconded by Councillor Bonner. Any discussion? All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. I would therefore ask for a motion for approval of the agenda as amended. Moved Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Bonner. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. And Your Worship, that item will go under other business. And a motion for adoption of the minutes is circulated. Moved Councillor Bonner, seconded Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any opposed? Motion carries. The Mayor's Report. Uh, we have a couple of very important presentations tonight, so I'll, I'll try not to take too much of everyone's time giving the Mayor's Report. Uh, I am pleased to uh, read out, though, a letter from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities uh, under the signature of the new SCM President, Garth Frizzell. Uh, and to summarize it, he uh, congratulates uh, Council uh, and sends on behalf of FCM uh, congratulations for uh, the implementation of the partner Equal Voice Central Vancouver Island for the excellent effort on the Toward Parity Demonstration Project for which $5,000 was received, Councillor Hemmons. Uh, our community was one of only 20 successful projects from across Canada to receive the grant funding from FCM's Toward Parity and Municipal Politics Project. The proposal was reviewed and approved by a panel of FCM board members and independent staff. Uh, this uh, is a signal honour for the community and I think it's certainly worth noting tonight. A uh, second item I want to mention, um, holiday family activity ideas by Parks, Recreation and Culture. Um, I want to give full credit to Parks and Rec as it's referred to for the efforts they've had to make this year during very difficult times dealing with numerous rule changes and directions uh, respecting public health and safety. Uh, and obviously the city understands that this holiday season is very different from uh, those due to the pandemic. Uh, we've had to see many events disappear, like the popular Winter Wonderland finale are no longer going to happen, but there are many other activities that you can engage in. Uh, please go to the uh, usual uh, city website, www.nanaimo.ca slash go to slash holiday dash ideas. Um, there's a list of free and low-cost family activity ideas uh, comprised of things that families can do over the winter break, uh, but please follow all protocol and safety. Oh my, what a year it's been. I, uh, I, I've jokingly said to many people, um, I'm hoping 2021 will be the year we were all wishing for last December when we were anticipating what 2020 was going to be like. Um, We'd, I think at that point we'd all heard something about this little virus and uh, here we are uh, down the road, $380 billion worth of uh, debt added to the federal government, uh, thousands of uh, people having passed, 
uh, thousands more suffering from COVID or hospitals full in many parts of the country. Uh, it has not been a year that anyone anticipated. But I want to say something very positive about uh, the city itself and its citizens. Uh, there has been a, a remarkable level of compliance by the citizens of this community when it came to taking directions respecting distancing and the wearing of masks. Um, the difficulties it presented for our staff, as I mentioned earlier, particularly for parks and recreation and culture in terms of community activities, the use of our parks, all of the sporting activities uh, in which many people wish to engage in this community. Uh, it has been a very difficult year and staff have had an incredible burden trying to deal with that. Uh, in addition, uh, on top of COVID and all the changes it has meant, uh, for individuals, uh, the businesses in our community that have suffered, the people who've lost employment, uh, who've seen literally their life's dreams washed away by a pandemic uh, which no one anticipated uh, in circumstances that were entirely uh, not their fault. Uh, I think we have to express some sympathy for those folks and understand how it's impacted everyone's life in this community. Uh, I want, though, to particularly recognize, as I say, the staff of the city, many of whom faced uh, job changes, job loss, uh, who pitched in, who took on new positions, who worked harder where it was necessary, and indeed even wasn't where it wasn't necessary just because they are the good community-minded and hard-working staff that we have in this city. We have been very, very fortunate in Nanaimo, and I want to express on behalf of Council my gratitude to everyone who has worked so hard redoubled their efforts, and candidly, and it can't go without being mentioned, put up perhaps on occasion uh, with impatience is the kindest word I can say, uh, and direct abuse from some members of the public who weren't as patient and kind as thoughtful, uh, and that is to be recognized and admired. Uh, indeed, uh, many of them have uh, gone beyond the the, the realm of human endurance in terms of enduring some remarks. Uh, we're all getting used to snippy emails in council, uh, but it's not something that staff should have to face, and they have, and I want to express again my thanks to all of them. Uh, on the front lines of things, our bylaw officers, our firefighters in the larger community, those in healthcare, the paramedics, uh, have all uh, taken on an extraordinarily difficult role. The opioid crisis continues, the numbers of overdoses continue, the number of deaths in our community due to the opioid crisis continues as it does across this province. Uh, it has been a difficult year. In the larger community, uh, we now have, I think, what I hope will be an enduring respect for the role of everyone who provides a service or works in our community and around the world indeed. We are very conscious now of the, the supply chain that no one talked about. There's a phrase that no one was using a year ago, the supply chain. The food we receive, the goods we need, the products we consume, indeed some of the services we receive, are all dependent on a whole bunch of people, some of whom we never thought about before. So in that sense, as we approach the Christmas season, uh, which is, I think, for many of us a time to express gratitude, uh, I'd like to think we're all going to be ever conscious hereafter in our lives about the gratitude we must feel for those who provide services, all of us in our community, and for the kindness that we hope to continue to ex express and extend to each other as we face what will be many more months of restrictions and indeed potentially more severe restrictions. Uh, one need only look east to the province of Ontario uh, or to Great Britain uh, to see what it means if the pandemic takes on a new and renewed vigor and the danger it means for people. As I said earlier, the reality is people have died that didn't deserve to, of course, but didn't need to die uh, because of a pandemic that no one saw coming uh, and perhaps some reacted to without the concern or took seriously uh, the challenge it was going to present for all of us. So, at the end of this, as mayor, I just ask each and every one of you, as we approach the Christmas season, as we celebrate the solstice, the returning of some light, that you think 
about everyone in your community and the respect that they deserve, that you bite your tongue on occasion, as some wise person once said, and I've said here before, keep your words soft and sweet because you never know when you're gonna to have to eat them. And I'd like to think that as we approach this holiday, please play by the rules. I don't expect 100% compliance. I'm not stupid. I didn't get this gray hair without living a little bit of life. But please, do the right thing. Wear your masks, continue to distance, look out for one another, and don't be shy if you're feeling sick, for heaven's sakes, to seek medical treatment. You don't want to be that innocent person who passes it on to somebody else uh, because you weren't paying attention. Uh, to counsel, because I get to say this, I just want to express my thanks to each and every one of you for the work that you've taken on. Uh, we have many more challenges ahead of us. To the staff, uh, again, uh, who have continued to serve in these difficult times, thank you. Uh, there is more work to come and more challenges to face, uh, but like everything in life, uh, we will get through this. And I am optimistic that by the time we celebrate the solstice next December, uh, we will be living something that may never be normal the way we remember it, uh, but will be better days. Better days are coming. As I've said to many of you individually and occasionally publicly, sometimes life is just about enduring till things change, and they will counsel. Citizens of Nanaimo, they will change, and they will get better, and we will see brighter and happier days ahead. So uh, thank you for letting me uh, dribble on a little more than usual. But this is, as I said at the beginning, a year like no other. Uh, we have uh, nothing to rise and report, Ms. Gurry. So I want to move on to uh, uh, two very uh, important presentations. Uh, Chief Fry is with us tonight. And uh, I have some speaking notes. Donna always insists that I make sure I cover the points. That's one thing about having an able administrative assistant for a council. So let's begin with the basics. I think everyone's heard Chief Fry's name the last few weeks for obvious reasons. Uh, she began her career in 1999 with the city of Nanaimo hired as a fire dispatcher. She carried out a progressive range of duties later in the roles of captain, deputy fire chief of communications with the city of Surrey. Returning to the city of Nanaimo as deputy fire chief, uh, chief of administration support services, uh, acting fire chief, then appointed, uh, she was then appointed as our first female fire chief in 2017, which was also the first for Vancouver Island and the second for British Columbia. She is also uh, the first vice president of the BC Fire Chiefs Association and of course, as we all know, uh, Joe Biden tells you that being vice president isn't the end of your career. Effective January 4th, 2021, Chief Fry will assume the position as chief of the Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services. And lest anyone miss the point of that, for those of you who aren't paying close attention, that makes her the chief of chiefs in British Columbia in the fire service. It is the biggest department and it is an incredible honor for her and the city. Uh, on behalf of Council and the citizens of the City of Nanaimo, we're honoured tonight to acknowledge, most particularly though, 20 years of Chief Fry's, Fry's loyal and exemplary service to the public safety in uh, Canada, and I'm going to present to her in a minute or two, on behalf of the Governor General of Canada, Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Julie Payette, the Fire Services Exemplary Service Medal and Certificate. Um, on a personal level, as I said, when this became official, um, we were all shedding tears of joy for our chief and tears of sadness that she's leaving us. But let us not for a moment uh, miss the historic importance of this moment. Uh, it uh, is a great honor for this city. Uh, it's a great honor for Chief Fry, and it couldn't go to a more deserving soul. I think it fair to say that uh, Mr. Rudolph, uh, who uh, in the quiet of my office from time to time does express uh, feelings that he wouldn't necessarily express, uh, is going to miss your guidance and assistance and support very much, uh, as will counsel. I think it fair to say, and I, I'm always bad with boundaries, so forgive me when I say this, 
but it's somewhat recognized in the larger community that um, firefighters tend to be males. I don't think the, uh, it's the most progressive group overall, and I'm sure my good friend Chad will forgive me, Porter, for saying this, uh, but I can't mention uh, Chief Fry without reflecting on the fact that uh, she's not here as a token, she's not going to Vancouver as a token, she's going there because she knows her job, she does it well, and she gained the uh, full support of the firefighters who served under her. So Chief Fry, congratulations. If you will step into the circle, I'm going to mask and present you with a certificate. The next item is a very, um, how shall I say, unusual presentation. It's not something that has uh, happened, I'm sure, in the city's history, potentially. I'd ask Barry Hornby to come down towards the front, to the podium, please. So as this city is well aware, on Thursday, December the 3rd, uh, this year, shortly after 12 p.m., a large fire broke out in the homeless encampment on Wesley Street, located immediately behind our Services and Resource Centre building. Fortunately, there were no injuries of occupants or city staff, uh, or the firefighters and others who attended. However, the fire fully destroyed multiple tents and triggered a number of propane tank explosions which shook nearby buildings. One of our city employees, bylaw officer Barry Hornby, rushed into the scene of this fiercely burning fire of tents and contents with tanks exploding and guided people to safety in the immediate vicinity out of harm's way. This situation could have been catastrophic had it not been for his actions and others. This is courage at its finest. I need also to convey that this is not in his job description as a bylaw enforcement officer who is responsible for enforcing municipal bylaws and providing public education, awareness programs, and services. Barry, I want to thank you for your extraordinary and selfless act of courage. I commend you for the remarkable uh, act of bravery without, without regard for your personal safety. And I am very honored and will in a minute or two present you with this plaque from the city of Nanaimo, which reads, presented to Barry Hornby in grateful appreciation for your selfless act of bravery on Thursday, December the 3rd, 2020. We thank you, Mayor Krogh, Council, and the citizens of Nanaimo. And again, if I can touch on a couple of boundaries, there is a world of social media which often repeats information that is not entirely accurate. People have different versions of events. People have different feelings about things that happened. Uh, but whatever else may come out of the story of the fire on December the 3rd, there is no question about the behavior, the courage demonstrated by Barry Hornby and others who attended at that scene and did their best to make uh, 
the situation much less of a disaster than it could have been and ensured the safety of many people. So to Barry again, I want to say on behalf of this very grateful city, congratulations, you have earned it. You are an, a perfect example of what public service at its best and finest is all about. Uh, without regard to your uh, own safety and concerns, you stepped in in a moment when many were panicked, when many were too stunned to know how dangerous the situation was, but you were there and we thank you. If you can again come forward. Somehow following those two presentations with committee minutes just doesn't seem to cut it. <laughs> However, they are simply to be received. Again, thank you to you, Chief Fry, and to Mr. Hornby, both of you, for coming tonight. I hope you uh, each have wonderful holidays because you're all back at work in January regardless. <laughs> A motion for adoption of consent items. Can we do that? No, it's just committee minutes. A motion for adoption of consent items. Councillor Bonner. Second. Second to Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Give me a second. A couple of pages to run through. Uh, we have no delegations, and we do have reports. Ms. Legan, just before Christmas, here to talk about money, the 2021-2025 financial plan. Thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce uh, the financial plan bylaw 2020, number 7320, for first, second, and third reading. Just a few key summary points. The provisional plan supports Council's priorities and enhances service levels through a number of initiatives and the addition of a few positions in the areas of public safety, the environment, and corporate services. The financial plan bylaw allows the city to proceed in a very timely manner to work on 2021 programs and projects. Council does have the opportunity to review the 2021 to 2025 financial plan in April prior to adoption of the bylaw in its final form and the property tax rates bylaw. That's my report. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that Financial Plan Bylaw 2020, number 7320, to confirm and adopt the 2021 to 2025 financial plan, pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any contrary? None opposed. Motion carries. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. I move that Financial Plan Bylaw 2020, number 7320, pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favour? Any contrary? 
Motion carries. Thank you very much. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. And I move that Financial Plan Bylaw 2020, number 7320, pass third reading. Second to Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any contrary? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Ligon. And Merry Christmas. Thank you. The next is the 100 Gordon Street uh, slash revised agreements. And that's Mr. Holm. Part of one of the longest running sagas of this community in the last few years and so delighted to see you here tonight, Mr. Holm, believe me. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I'm actually- uh, You can take your mask off. It'll Sure, thank you, thank Your Worship. I'm just actually going to turn it over to Mr. Corson to speak to this item. Very good. Mr. Corson. Great, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just uh, as Council knows, we had the groundbreaking about a year ago for the hotel, which was much anticipated. It's very nice to be able to look out there now and see that uh, uh, the work of many years is starting to come to fruition, and we see the the foundation work is going to take place, the stairwell is going up, and uh, the hotel is scheduled to open hopefully in the spring, uh, no later than the, um, the summer of 2022. In, uh, in working with the hotel developer, PEG, uh, there's three outstanding items that we've uh, been working with them on. Council may remember that when we sold the property to PEG, uh, we put something called an option to purchase on the title, which required PEG to commence construction by last December and to spend a million dollars in foundation work by that date. Uh, PEG have now met those numbers. They've shared their uh, financials with me and uh, that could be removed from title now, which will allow them to have a clear title. Uh, we certainly recommend that. When, uh, when the project started, they were granted a tax exemption certificate from the city, uh, which required them to uh, be open soon. And uh, of course, with the pandemic and everything and starting a bit later, we're asking council to move that date back to, uh, to 2022. And, and the other piece was a parking agreement we have with PEG. They're using the uh, VICC parkade for their hotel parking. They had asked to use 60 spaces. They've asked now to reduce that to 30 and they'll pay uh, a daily rate going forward. So financially, still good for the city, but uh, less of a financial commitment for them going forward. So those are the three items that are before you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm sorry, Your Worship, there's one other thing I did want to mention. Um, we uh, have set up a web uh, camera on the hotel, so folks at home can actually watch construction. It takes photos a couple times a day, and uh, folks who don't want to come downtown, we encourage you to come downtown, but if you can't make it downtown, you can actually look on the project website and follow along. And the idea is when the hotel opens uh, in a year and a half, we'll have a nice time-lapse video to show the progress. Thank you. Oh, I can't resist, Mr. Corson. and it may not be as exciting as watching eagles soar on the video camera, but it'll help downtown soar. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Hammonds. Uh, thank you. I move uh, that Council direct staff to remove the option to purchase registered in favour of the City of Nanaimo from 100 Gordon Street. Update the revitalization tax exemption agreement for 100 Gordon Street with PEG companies and enter into a parking agreement with PEG companies courtyard by Marriott Hotel to rent reserved parking stalls for use by hotel guests within the city owned parkade located within the conference center parkade at 101 Gordon Street. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. Any discussion? All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. This is very positive news for the city and we're delighted to see it happen. Uh, the next is BC Hydro Streetlight Upgrades. Mr. Sims. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a brief report in front of you. Um, as Council is aware, we've been undertaking our streetlight changeover to LED and it's a multi-phase project. As we do this, what we do is a, a, an actual streetlight design to make sure that the lighting meets a certain standard of illumination and so that creates a safety on the streets. So BC Hydro is also undertaking an LED exchange program um, but there's no real opportunity to do a, a revised design or to improve the lighting to uh, meet current standards. So the report in front of you outlines some of those issues. 
essentially what DC Hydro is doing is changing out the existing high pressure sodium lights, the orange lights, for newer LED lights. They've asked that we provide some input as to color temperature and, and wattage, but as far as the pattern of lighting, we don't really have any input or any say. So the existing lighting standards will continue to be deficient where BC Hydro lease lights are in place, and there's no opportunity to add new street lights. The intent of the recommendation here is, is really to provide um, a policy defense in the event of future um, liability claims on the part of the public. The, the street is too dark and there was a car accident and that sort of thing. Um, this is from in consultation with our insur insurer, the Municipal Insurance Association, they've advised that the strongest policy defense is when council makes, a, makes it as a policy, and so that's the report in front of you. Um, the, the, this policy defense is usually in cases where it's impractical for this city to comply with its current standards, and so it, it's a recognition that we can't get there right away. Staff are working on a plan to say, in the areas where we do have least lights or deficient areas of, stand, of, of lighting standards, how do we get there? So that's a, a lighting plan, but it's a long and expensive road. And until we get to that, that uh, perfect utopia, we're asking that you, that we're re recommending that you adopt this approach. Councilor Brown. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just a question through you to Mr. Sims. Um, the East Wellington Park uh, recently was, you know, we had the discussion around potential use for astronomy, and our current city guidelines aren't the best for uh, the, the Kelvin of the light isn't, uh, and the way it refracts, refracts into telescopes and scatters isn't the best for stargazing, and I'm just wondering about, um, uh, will this hydro policy, because there is some street lights near there, taken some suggestions for uh, just that one particular use case on that one particular site. Um, and I'm just curious about how do we try to uh, nudge them in a direction that's better for astronomy. Thank you, Worship. I think that to Councillor Brown's point, I think that's, a, that's an excellent opportunity to, to connect with them and we can do that, certainly. I think it's, you know, we're trying to move that area into a dark sky kind of approach and if we can get there, we will for sure. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Sims. Uh, just a question on, um, it's on the report about input on street light color. Um, I, uh, especially in residential areas, I think it's important to maintain sort of the, the orange, sort of the warm uh, color as opposed to sort of like those bright white uh, lights, just because if it is outside your bedroom window, um, it does have an impact, like blue light's not good for you if you're trying to sleep. Um, and so, in terms of the change out, uh, is that being taken into consideration? What is our uh, light tone color for the, the LED change out? Right, that's a good question, um, Your Worship. To, um, to that point, on our arterial roads, our major roads, we have the cooler light at the, the 3,000 Kelvin, I believe it is, and then the residential areas, the higher. Have I got that backwards? I'm, the warmer, it's the warmer <laughs> temperature in the residential areas, and that would be the same uh, input we would provide to BC Hydro. And it's interesting to note that that study is actually, um, it's not a, an issue with, um, that was one individual study that was has been debunked, in fact. Great. So, just to clarify, on residential, it'll still stay warm, and it'll be uh, it'll be the warmer version of LED lights. It'll be whiter, certainly, than the the very orange high pressure sodium, mm -hmm. but it'll be the warmer of the spectrum, to so that there's not that that uh, harsh harshness. Right. Thanks, Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. This is one of the many things that comes in front of me that I didn't know before um, and probably would only have known had I read this report and that is that our street lights don't cover our streets properly 
I guess that's basic what is being said in this report. Um, was there ever a time when these were originally installed that the streets were being covered? Like, was it was their standards different back then? Well, Your Worship, I think the um, this is the the story of amalgamation, right? And 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 the the sort of haphazard uh, means of development that that occurred, you know, from rural areas that that were uh, originally. The subdivision approving officer was the Ministry of Transportation, and the development were ditches, culverts, and and uh, the occasional light on a hydro pole. That that's kind of how we got here. Uh, as standards have evolved in the last 30 years, you know, of course, lighting standards keep up, and we require the installation of streetlights. Um, that that's that's the difference. That where we do have city-owned streetlights, um, it meets the standards, or it will. And but where we have the hydro lease sites, we don't. And so this thirty million dollar tag that we have in the report is if we were to install our own lights, standards, the whole pole, the whole kit and caboodle, not just put more lights on more poles. Correct. Is that an option? Putting more lights on more poles? I think that's part of the study that Mr. Rose is proposing. Is just how do we get to to the end? Um, from here, and I, my understanding is that BC Hydro is not really enthusiastic about adding additional lease lights. So they're we're maintaining the the existing complement of lights, but to add more because we've we've checked. There's uh, a number of locations that are dark, and simply throwing a light head on a on a pole would be would be a solution. Uh, but they're not. They don't want to have that increased uh, level of burden on their own infrastructure. Okay. Hmm. This is what the modern world looks like, providing more and more services and more and more minerals sucked out of the ground and more and more of everything. And I don't want to sound negative, but this is where the environment versus public demand for things like this come up against it. Um, having been raised in Coombs where there were no street lights, I think there's one or two now, um, somehow we managed to survive. But in a modern city, we expect in 20 kilometers of 20 kilometers long roughly and two kilometers wide everybody wants a street light because we can't possibly function without street lights but it's it, we know from the report how incredibly costly it is and the impact it has in terms of consumption anyways pardon me for blathering on councillor armstrong thank you there was a point i was making at the last meeting with mr rose and i don't think i got it across when you're looking at the angles especially on hill and i'm going to refer to uplands there's one of the lights when you drive up there, it's absolutely blinding in your eyes the way it's it's geared. Is there a way that it can be geared downward so it doesn't blind you? I think it's because of the, when you go up the hill. Is, like, is that taken into consideration that, that like if you're in a vehicle, like it's very blinding on your eyes. Like sometimes I've actually had to pull over because my eyes are just like vibrating. Uh, if that particular one, if you could let us know, we can probably look at it and, look. and address it. That would Thank be you. Yeah. But you do look at that, right? When you're looking at hills, that Typically not. I would say not. It, it, we look at the light distribution on the ground, but not necessarily the angle. Of, yeah. Councillor Hammonds. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I move that uh, st direct staff to work with BC Hydro to develop a street light replacement plan that replaces the BC Hydro lease light fixtures with fixtures of equivalent wattage and with a temperature that aligns with the city's selection criteria, and finalize the city-wide lighting study and present a prioritization implement implementation strategy to council for future, cap future capital planning considerations. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Councillor Bonner. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question, if I may. Um, we've talked a lot about replacing street lights and, and putting in smart light fixtures so that down the road we'll be able to utilize the, the qualities or the, the power of uh, uh, smart fixtures. Are the ones that BC Hydro is putting in the same type of fixtures that we're putting on ours? Uh, you, Your Worship, not not at this at this time. They've they've been very. Um constrained in, in what they've offered us you, you can we can pick a color and we can pick a bright uh, wattage essentially and uh, and that's that's the extent of it that is unfortunate because this is the type of infrastructure we need for the future and, and this seems to be a, a lost opportunity i would hope that bc hydro who wants to be a good partner with nanaimo would reconsider thank you any discussion 
All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is the Nanaimo Food Policy Council. And Mr. Corson, I see you're approaching the podium. Yes, thank you, Worship. I believe I have a Ms. Constable put together a PowerPoint for me, which is very nice of her. And I'll just uh, quickly go through it, and I know there's some, uh, probably like be some discussion from Council on this. So the uh, purpose of the report is to provide you options on how we can support the creation of this independent food uh, policy council to further enhance our food security. Uh, this is a motion that came from October. And this uh, came out of the pandemic when we were looking at emergency food. And through the Health and Housing Task Force, we set up a working group to work on this. So we uh, were asked to endorse the emergency food nutrition strategy and then support the creation of the Food Policy Council. And uh, that's why we're here tonight. There's a beautiful food <laughs> policy picture. Uh, so what is a Food Policy Council? So they're commonplace across the province, and uh, they provide a forum and uh, to talk about food system, uh, stake stakeholders, and how we can work collaboratively to bring this together. Uh, they're arm's length, and they're usually independent of government and uh, they really provide that role of facilitation and uh, they work with uh, us at the local government level. So they help address coordination, which is uh, an issue uh, we were able to explore through the working group and the Health and Housing Task Force. Uh, again, find those relationships uh, along the food, food supply line. Um, it'd be a sounding board of advocacy, which is important, and uh, talk about some of the policy that we can uh, implement as staff. Uh, Comox has an example that Council, I think, is aware of. And, uh, and they look at kind of the regional, more regional approach uh, to food security in, in their area. And the PowerPoint is... There we go. Oh, thanks. Oh. So the recommendation is that uh, Council support staff participation as a non-voting member on the Nanaimo Food Policy Council that uh, a letter is sent to the RDN asking them to appoint a staff liaison as well so we can get that regional context. And, uh, and as you probably noted in your staff report, most of the funding, a lot of the funding for, um, for this uh, comes through uh, VHA, the Island Health, and we're asking that uh, a letter of support go to FoodShare who, who would coordinate the program, um, that they ask for additional money from Island Health to help them keep their operations going. So that's the recommendation of worship. Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I just want to move the recommendations for discussion. Second. Your, Your Worship, um, I believe Council um, might have um, some amendments they possibly might want to make. So I think moving them one at a time and then seconding and then going one at a time would be the um, best way. For this so evening. move item one. Can we do that, Councillor Armstrong? Sure. The first recommendation? Yeah. And there's a seconder? Councillor Martman and Councillor Gesselbrock. You He's wish to say to something. Well, He's you calling wish to you make to an speak. amendment? Oh, yeah, I, I speak. I thought you said Councillor Martman first. No, I said you. Seconded. Oh, great. Um, wakey, wakey. I, I think that uh, a food policy council is um, very important um, to, to move forward uh, you know, our strategic orientation to improving food security. Um, it, uh, it's an agency made up of representing individuals across the, um, our food systems, you know, from farmers, producers, uh, nonprofits that providing food services, um, and distributors. And I think um, it's proven to be a, a very effective uh, method for, for moving forward um, food security initiatives. Um, uh, you know, there's there's food policy councils all across uh, BC and, and Canada, and um, the uh, I think my question um, is just around first of the the, the terms of reference uh, for the food policy council. Um, I've got a question to staff and then a comment. Uh, when do we uh, foresee that terms of reference being uh, uh, developed, um, and, and by who? Yeah, uh, thanks, Your Worship, through to Council Gessler Brex. So we'd, we'd expect that to actually uh, be a joint work between ourselves, uh, staff, and, uh, and food chair. 
and uh, hopefully in the spring. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I noticed that on the um, the agenda, the Comox Valley uh, terms of reference was is included, and um, I think that's you know what we're we're hoping to model off. Um, I think in terms of the importance, um, uh, the strategic importance of this, and um, and, and having a, you know direct link to council. Uh, I know Comox Valley has a uh, uh, an elected official that's a voting member on their uh, food policy council, and I think that's important that uh, we have that representation on on our food policy council. So I, I'd like to move an amendment um, that um, to the motion that has the motion support city and Nanaimo staff participation in the Nanaimo food policy council as non-voting members and include one council appointed Nanaimo councillor as a voting member. Seconded Councillor Bonner. Uh, so we're simply adding the, uh, at the end of the existing motion that there be a city council member on board. Is there any, Ms. Gurry? Um, yeah, just including a member of council yes. um, that is a voting member. Yes. Yeah. Any discussion? Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I'm concerned about uh, being a vote, voting member on that. I think it should be the recommendation comes back to council and then all of council votes on it. I, I don't think our council members should have a vote at those committees. I think we're there as, a, as an observer. Then the recommendations will come back to this table if required by staff and that's when we vote. So I, I'm concerned about that because I mean, there's been lots of other committees that have asked us to have voting and we've, in the pan, I'm going to the past where we said, no, it's not appropriate for us to do that because now you're bringing the p political realm in by one individual to it instead of, because it's not a council committee. Or, I mean, it's not a mayor and council committee. It's an outside agency committee, which we've never had voting privileges on those before. It's always been, you go there, you can go there as a non-voting member. Then the recommendation comes back from that staff member and then all of council votes on it. So I'm quite concerned about having a, a voting member of council on it. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Worship. Um, this is a, uh, a governance structure that is, is commonly used, having a, a, an elected official as a voting member as part of the council. And basically how the council works, uh, you know, the, the city is an important stakeholder in um, the development of the, the food system, and it's important that there is a, a voice um, representing the, the city's perspective at that table, and that any recommendations that's made by the whole Food Policy Council, um, it those recommendations do come to the full council table, and then, is, you know, if there's recommendations that the, the city would act on, then all of council would have to discuss those recommendations. And so I think that if we um, want to give this the level of importance that uh, I think food security does require. Um, having uh, uh, an elected representative on the board is, is, uh, is an important um, component of doing so. Thank you. Councillor Bonner and then Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm, support, I'm supporting the, the, the motion. Um, and the reason being is, is we learned a lot and, and further to your comments earlier at, at your, your opening remarks there, we learned a lot during this, this pandemic. And one of the ones is the fragility of food distribution in our city. Um, and both the province and the, and the feds recognize this. And that is why there's a tremendous amount of money coming into our, into our community just for food distribution. And to make sure that people who could not afford food for whatever reason were be able to get it. Um, so it's... I think it's a rather important thing, and, and I, I, I think it's more important than what we've been presented with here today in the report. I mean, it's a great report, I appreciate it, but I think we need to step it up a bit, and I think part of that would be is to have a member of council on this group, because it's gonna look at more than just making sure that you know we have people producing food, it's gonna make sure that we have food distribution uh, available, uh, it's going to make sure that we have the facilities to store food, uh, things along those lines, and and in during um, you know a future emergency, be part of that uh, of that work that gets done. So um, that's why I think it needs to have a little bit more of a an oomph, if I may say, by of having a, a council member on there. And I'm willing to toy with the idea of voting or non-voting, but I definitely think we should have a council member represented there. Thank you. 
Councillor Armstrong? I agree that a council member should be there, but non voting. And I go back to the days of Safer Nanaimo. I don't know if Ms. Gurry recalls this or not, but there was a complaint to the Ombudsman, and we had to rechange that because it, was a, it, it wasn't a city committee meeting, especially at the time, and we weren't allowed to do it. So I would, I would ask if, if we do do it as a voting, that we do get the legal opinion on that, whether it go to the Ombudsman or whoever, because I know there was issues in the past where the whole committee had to be restructured and became a council committee because uh, there was laws around that. So I would like that clarified before we even vote on if it is a voting member. Councillor Brown and Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm having trouble with the, being a voting member as well. Um, I, I think it makes sense for uh, a council member to be on there. I think it might put staff in an awkward position. Um, I've, I've sort of seen that before in committees um, uh, like this, where the staff position can be sort of an awkward one because <clears throat> um, it's just a little bit less, you know, more restricted and, and hard to have uh, that conversation because ultimately they have to bring things back and get the council opinion and then go back. And so I, I do agree that it should be a council member. Um, I think, um, but I, I would be curious, I'm f having trouble understanding why we would actually need to be a voting member. That's, um, that's, uh, that's the thing I'm struggling with. So I think it's important to have that liaison back and forth communication two ways, but I am wanting to know the, a little bit more behind the logic of a, a voting member. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I certainly uh, support this concept of the Food Policy Council and uh, and having a staff participate um, and having a council member participate as well. But I tend to uh, agree that uh, I think um, it would be more appropriate that the council member, as the staff member, be a non-voting uh, observer and can bring uh, uh, recommendations and suggestions back to council for discussion. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, in terms of non-voting and voting, my understanding is just on the governance structure that uh, the Comox Valley Food Policy Council, which has been quite effective, um, it was a voting member. I mean, I think if we could look more into, you know, what are the consequences of voting, I, I, don't, I don't share the same uh, reservations about having it voting or not. I don't think that it's going to uh, create the disruption that um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing expressed or, or cause uh, uh, legal implications. Um, there may be things that I may not be aware about, um, but it would be worth uh, to inquire with um, the uh, other, um, you know, with, with the models that do exist, that there is a council member that is uh, on the board, you know, what the ac exact setup is and, and why they were, a, you know, a voting member uh, or not. Um, these things take all types of forms and I think um, you know with a council it's a group of people discussing what is the best uh, way forward to advance you know strategic action around food security and I don't know if it really makes a difference whether the council member is voting or, or non-voting and so um, my preference would be uh, to um, to have staff look into if there's any uh, implications around that and, and maybe we can adjust the amendment um i'm wondering councillor gesselbrock if uh oh sorry sorry you're i'd be happy to have you know the amendment and include one council point and, and then i'm a councillor um and then leave off as a voting member and then we can um uh determine whether they're voting or non-voting after there's a terms of reference discussion with uh, the, 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 the convening agency. Um, is, there, is there agreement from the seconder? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. So the motion now will be support city of Nanaimo, pardon me, if the amendment is to add the phrase then Ms. Gurry, just so we're clear. Uh, um, include one member of council. Thank you. Without mentioning voting or non-voting. Um, all those in favor of the amendment? Any contrary? None. On the main motion then, all those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. 
Let's do the second one, Councillor um, Gesselbrock. We'll let you have the privilege tonight if you want to go for number two. Okay, uh, move uh, that we send a letter to the Regional District and Nanaimo Board of Directors requesting a staff liaison be appointed to the Nanaimo Food Policy Council to represent regional interests. Second to Councillor Hemmins. Any discussion? Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, in the first one, we just had a discussion around um, how it uh, we'd add a council member, but then, you know, structurally, more or less, the regional board is the same. Um, but we're just saying, at requesting they would have a staff liaison. Um, I'm just noticing an inconsistency. Councillor Gesselbrock. Um, I think that uh, these are the original recommendations that were put forward, and I think you know this is a, a city in Nanaimo initiated um, uh, uh, food policy council. Um, the decision, you know, wasn't to go through the, the regional district. However, I think including a, a regional district elected a member to this food policy council uh, could be a, a worthwhile um, uh, endeavor as well. And. Be curious to you know hear feedback from the rest of council potentially on that and from staff. Thank you, Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we will if we send this letter, um, it's going to come in front of the board anyway because it will require staff time. Um, so there will be a financial um, issue there. Uh, we could raise it at that time to also suggest that a, a director also sit on the board which I would be in favor of. I, I was going to say that's entirely the regional district's decision and we won't be making any decisions about that. Tonight. Absolutely not, <laughs> but you know, we could raise it at that point. <laughs> Councillor Turley. Thank you, Worship. Um, I uh, threw into the rest of council. Um, I have three concerns. Um, number one, an email that uh, Councillor Gesselbach sent around, he made reference to uh, uh, food Council um, requiring $30,000 $30, of funding for, from somewhere, but no specific source. So that got me thinking, if that's coming from the city, I'm just wondering, um, there's, there's some of the um, examples of, of how these councils work, uh, kind of are in a gray area, in my opinion, with regard to competition with, with private business, and, and I'm not sure our position, hopefully that 30,000 has come from another source and not the city. Um, secondly, the uh, Comox uh, Valley Food Council is, it looks like it's a um, initiative from the regional district there, not, not the city of Comox. Um, and I'm wondering why we're not following the same lead uh, because ultimately the, vol the volume of uh, food production is not Within Nanaimo, it's it's so outside of the city of Nanaimo. Uh, so it might, odd unless I'm misunderstanding everything, is it it would make more sense to be a regional district initiative. Um, and to do to do to do. And I guess the other question would be uh, if there is funding involved, um, I'm assuming that the regional district would be taking part as well. So. Um, I wouldn't mind getting some uh, answers to those concerns if somebody has them. Thank you. I think they are all legitimate questions, uh, Councillor Turley, but the three recommendations we have aren't asking us to spend any money yet. Councillor Gesselbrock, is there something we should to add before I go to Councillor Brown? Councillor Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. <coughs> I'm inclined to, to vote in favor and sort of pass judgment, but I think that terms of reference is going to be crucial because if, you know, for example, I think it would be an extremely odd situation that you have an RDN staff liaison as a voting, voting member and an, a city councilor is not, or vice versa, and so I think it can create a little bit of a, a governance issue, so I think whenever that terms of reference comes back, um, that would be the time maybe to evaluate and then have a little more discussion on those items. Councillor Gespark, is there anything further you wish to say before we vote on the second recommendation? Um, I just a point of discussion to Councillor Turley's points. I think that those are important uh, points around sort of the, the, the regional nature of a food policy council. I think just given the scope of and the size of our regional district and the other municipalities involved, that 
Um, it's important to, to begin here in Nanaimo and build strength in the council, but I think that the natural evolution would that it would uh, expand its scope and, and representation. And the first start is, uh, you know, inviting that regional district uh, representative. Um, and I think that, um, you know, carrying these recommendations forward with further discussion with uh, food share and staff on the terms of reference is going to provide some clarity and, and potentially some, some more recommendations as we go forward. Any further discussion? We have a motion in front of us. All those in favor? Contrary, motion carries. Third one, Councillor Gesselbrock, do you want to? Thank you, Worship. Uh, provide a, a letter, I move that we provide a letter of support to the Nanaimo Food Share requesting the Nanaimo Regional Medical Health Officer provide Nanaimo Food Share with an additional 5,000 annually to the Health Authority's locally designated food hub to contribute to the administrative costs of coordinating the Nanaimo Food Policy Council. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Councillor Gesselbrock, do you wish to speak to it? I think it's fairly straightforward, and I'd remind everyone we're not at the stage where we're committing money, but I have no doubt we're going to get asked for money at some point, potentially. All those in favor? Any contrary? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And Your Worship, I believe Council Gesselbrock has an additional motion that he would like to make regarding this matter. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just uh, within the uh, report, uh, there was uh, $15,000 that um, the food share, so the food share is the convening agency of all these other agencies that will uh, create the Food Policy Council, and they're receiving uh, some money from Island Health already as being a food hub. Um, that money does carry with it uh, a bunch of other uh, responsibilities, and I don't think that it really addresses sort of the coordination of the Food Policy Council. There's also another $15,000 that was given this year around uh, emergency um, uh, COVID response um, and that it was suggested within the report that that could be used to get the Food Policy Council up and running. Um, however, I think that that does um, narrow the focus and there's some responsibilities of just keeping it focused to the emergency response and this Food Policy Council, uh, you know, if we're following the mandate of, of what was outlined sort of in the COMOX and, and what, we're, you know, I, I believe that we're hoping to have an, an agency that's helping coordinate a larger uh, food system strategy, um, that that money is not really appropriate for startup. And so I think um, the costs that other food policy councils are, are faced with for administrating, coordinating, and, and setting a strategic direction um, for this is around $30,000 a year. Um, I think that it's important that uh, getting um, this agency up and go going and, and providing us uh, what we're hoping for in terms of direction on, on food security, that uh, it's properly funded to be able to do that work. And so um, I've got a motion um, that I'd like to move that staff liaise with food share and prepare a report for the Finance and Audit Committee outlining any potential funding shortfalls the Food Policy Council may have and provide options for municipal uh, funding support. Second to Councillor Martman. Discussion on this? Councillor Gesselbrock, you want to speak to uh, Just more? really quickly, um, I think, um, you know, uh, with, with staff reaching out to Food Share and having the discussion around um, uh, potential funding shortfalls and concurrently uh, shoring up the terms of reference, I think that a more uh, sort of fulsome report of what uh, will be provided to uh, Council and some potential costs could be made um, to make further decisions around um, uh, you know, looking at potential funding options if needed. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I said a few minutes ago I certainly support uh, the concept of the, uh, the Food Policy Council. I think this request or this motion is somewhat premature. We're still talking about terms of reference and, and, and whether people are voting or non-voting, and uh, I would prefer that the uh, the organization gets on its feet and has a look at its uh, financial needs and requirements. And if they feel at some future point that they uh, need to come to the city or the regional district with uh, requests, then they are, of course, open to do so. But uh, to, to ask uh, to go to them right now and say, oh, please give us options for how we can give you funding, uh, which is how I read this motion, um, I, I can't support it at this time. I think it's premature. Thank you. 
Councillor Armstrong? Yeah, I agree with Councillor Thorpe. I think that the terms of reference, everything needs to get up and running and then find out because it may come back that there's an even larger ask. So I think uh, they've got enough seed money to start, get them going, and then once they get a proper report, then come back to us. Uh, I'm also cognizant of how much work our staff has on their plate right now with Reimagine Nanaimo and all that other stuff. So it would fall into an already overburdened staff to do that particular report. So I would prefer to wait till um, the, um, the group is up and running and can do assessment of what kind of money they need, what the seed money is. I believe 15,000 is good seed money to start and then come back, um, especially if the RDN is going to be involved, we might look at a, a cost sharing model. So for me, I think it's a, a pr premature motion as well. Thank you. Councillor Marmon. Thank you. Um, I'd like to try and make a friendly amendment to it then. Um, I understand what people are saying about process and timelines. So I would like to say after the terms of references have been established, add that to the front. I appreciate what you're saying. I'm not sure just adding that is appropriate. In other words, that it, it defines it as well as it could. I mean, I, I think my impression is listening to councillors Thorpe and, and Armstrong is that uh, and I'm getting the sense from Council, we want to know that this thing is going to have enough interest, if you will, and support that it will actually start to function and then be in a position to come back and say, this is the budget, this is what we need. I mean, that's generally the normal course that these things follow. You don't sort of offer or work with somebody to find out what they're going to need if they haven't got the wherewithal to figure out what they need to start with before they come and ask you. So I'm... Uh, I'm if you make the motion and get a seconder, then, and it passes, so be it. Councillor Gesselbrock? Just, just to speak to that, uh, there are some process things that need to happen. Um, we do need to have the terms of reference shored up um, and, and get an idea of, of what is needed. But I don't think that there's adequate funding to get that set up. Um, and, and to get for the initial year of, of the Food Policy Council. And um, I'm not sure, you know, how thought through the process of, of getting this going was, but my understanding and from, from conversations, there may not be uh, sufficient money for each, the initial coordination of what this organization is initially going to do. And so it's important that we have that conversation with the convening agency to make sure that there is enough money to actually execute on drawing all the different groups together, having a meeting, being able to set an agenda and carry forward action items that we just, yeah, I think that conversation needs to happen. And this motion does speak to that. And whether um, a, uh, a terms of reference, uh, and I think it's good that staff do need to have that conversation around a terms of reference and have that shored up so that we can get to this part of the, around the funding and, and that'll happen whether it's going concurrently or stepwise. And so adding in that the terms of reference, you know, be completed uh, before, you know, a report comes to the finance and audit, you know, looking at potential shortfalls, then I think that's great. Unless I've had a brain lapse, the only motion in front of us right now is the one on the screen. That's correct, Your Worship. So that has been moved and seconded. As it is on the floor and... Um, no one has moved an amendment yet. No. So, Councillor Bonner, on the main motion until somebody moves an amendment or... No, no um, um, Your Worship, through you to Councillor Martman, um, an amendment hasn't been made to this motion. This motion is on the floor. That's the motion on the floor on the screen. Councillor Bonner? Oh, speaking to the motion, um, I, th I think it's important that we, we have some sort of idea in terms of costing. Uh, looking at the uh, Comox Valley um, uh, organization, uh, they have actually deliverables that they give to their council uh, and to the, to the RDN, uh, to their, the regional district. Um, and I think those come at a cost, right? And uh, w we set forward on this path because we were in the middle of the pandemic, we realized that the issues that, that were facing many of the people in our community. Um, and so I think it's important that not only does this organization get up and functioning, but they have the capacity and, and financial capacity to make sure that they're successful. 
So I, I do believe that there will be some sort of funds required. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, this motion speaks to finding out what that might be. Uh, we have done this in the past with the Health and Housing Task Force and the Economic Development folks where we've put money aside prior to the full terms of reference being exampled. Um, I think I just view this as, uh, as, as coming up with a figure that we can then talk about um, that might uh, work. And, and I assume that it's going to be within what the terms of reference are going to be because that's how they'll be operating. So I'm in favor of the motion. Councillor Armstrong, then Martin, and then Gesselbrock. So I, I'd, I'd researched the uh, Comox Valley, and they had $10,000 seed money, and they managed to do all that. And then they came to council and asked for $70,000. So that's my concern. I would like to wait on this until the committee's up and running, staff is there, they come forward with the report from that committee, and then say, you know, uh, based on this, we are now looking for 60000 70000 80000 because we're going to be piecemealing this. And I'd much rather wait until they actually know what we're doing. What is the commitment from partners? We hear that they're going to commit. Yet when you read the report, some people that were supposed to committed backed out at the last minute. And the big driver behind all these other food councils that was started in Squamish first was their um, health partners. And that's where the majority of money comes from. So I think we need to really look at it. And I, I personally, I won't be voting for this at this particular time. I'll be waiting until the actual uh, group is established and then comes back. Thank you. Councillor Martman. Thank you. In speaking to food security in our city in particular, this has been an issue that has been ongoing for decades. And COVID really brought to light some of the insecurities that people have around providing food for their children and their families. I think we need to get an understanding in order to be successful. We, want, we know that food share is doing good work. We know we support food security. Um, we purchased five acres farms. This is about coordination. This is about communication. This is about bringing together the partners. If they don't have the funding, and that's all we're looking for, is staff to liaison to find out, do they have what they need to, in order to be successful, and to bring it back to a finance and audit committee where we can discuss this we wouldn't even be making decisions on what the amount is. We don't know that. We know that other councils, it's been approximately 30,000. But what we're looking for is along with the terms of references that we don't, we're not creating initiatives that we're setting up to fail. So I definitely will support this motion because it's at least saying this conversation needs to take place. We need to find out how to help them be successful, and then we can have further discussions when it comes back to us. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Worship. Um, I think uh, I have a, an amendment that I, I hope will appease, you know, some of the councillors in terms of. Um, process of having the terms of reference in place. Um, we're, we're only really asking enough money, you know, it, to, to check in with food share to make sure that there's enough money to get this organization up and running and cover, you know, years operating and, and other, other food policy councils, I, I, just to give a reference, was $30,000 to coordinate and, 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 and operate per year. Um, getting it going and there is some funding that exists, we just need to make sure that staff have a conversation with the convening organization to make sure that the costs to get it up and going are there. And so um, if, you know, I had the council's pleasure just to uh, add an amendment that add in the clause, finalize the terms of reference so that the, the motion reads that staff liaise with food share finalize the terms of reference, and prepare a report for the Finance and Audit Committee outlining any potential funding shortfalls the Food Policy Council may have and provide options for municipal funding support after the terms of reference. Uh, do we have a friendly amendment, Second, the seconder? Right. And just to speak to that, 
when we say finalize the terms and prepare a report for the Finance and Audit Committee outlining any potential funding shortfalls, in that report it will come to Council. Food chair in the conversation with uh, staff may say, we don't have enough money to coordinate the initial startup of this organization. This is the funding shortfall for that, $5,000, $10,000, who knows. If we want to complete X, Y, and Z within the terms of reference this year, we might have a sh shortfall of whatever, and then that'll come back to council and we can make a decision from there. I don't think it needs to be complicated. It's just more information so that we can get this up and going. And I don't wish to prolong this debate all night either. <laughs> Councillor Brown. <laughs> Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Um, happy to support, and Councillor Turley also has his hand up. Um, I have a question though, with that friendly amendment then, would it, f the creation of the terms of reference would fall exclusively to food share in the city of Nanaimo, which is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the policy group to determine their own terms of reference. Or is that, do we understand that the city and food share will create the terms of reference for the Food Policy Council? Food share I, is the lead agency. They're the convening agency. Yes. Um, I think other folks are going to have um, something to say about the terms of reference. And I, I personally don't, I don't think it should be food share in the city um, creating the terms of reference. Councillor Turley, let's go to you. Bring us some wisdom. Guide us out of the morass. You need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, there we are. I got it. I did, and then somebody unmuted me. So, um, so the issue, the challenge I have is that we're asking staff to liaise with food chair to find out how much money they want. Uh, that was not the case for the health and housing or the economic development task force. They, that came from the the council representatives that that sat on those committees or task force. And they, they came in from at different times to request they needed needed funding. Um, so I, I don't see this as, as any different. We're going to have a, according to the first thing we passed, we're going to have a councillor sitting on the uh, on this council. Uh, I would think it would be up to that councillor to bring forward the, the request uh, from the council as to what financial needs they are. The problem with going about it, the way that uh, Councillor Ben Gasselberg has, has suggested is that there's no accountability because they can ask for whatever they want. Um, and are we going to say, well, yeah, okay, yeah, we, we agreed to fund the shortfalls, so so uh, that's it. Um, I, I think they need to do their due, due diligence and uh, provide a, an explanation, uh, like the other task force did, on what what it is they need and how much they need. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the staff should be um, involved in this part. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm not going to support this because like, unlike the three previous motions, which are towards setting up the Food Policy Council, this is actually t tweaking the operations of that Food Policy Council, which I don't think is what we were after. Um, so I am 100% behind food security, 100% behind resourcing that collectively as a community. Um, but I'm not comfortable with the process of asking um, what the funding should be before the group has even had a conversation. So I won't be voting in support of this. Thank you. So we have an amended motion in front of us by consent. All those in favor of the amended motion? Councillors Martman, Gesselbrock, and Bonner. And those opposed? Councillors Armstrong, Hemmons, Krogh, Thorpe, and Brown. And Turley opposed as well. Thank you. Um, I, this is not, lest anyone watching this thinks this is the end of Council's, I think, significant interest in this, but it is definitely a stopping point where we want to get more information and be satisfied that this uh, will move forward. Hold up, sorry, Your Worship. I'm, I'm confused. Were we voting on an amendment there, or the actual motion? No, it was amended by consent. Yeah, it was. It was a friendly amendment, Your Worship, through you to Councillor Brown. Yes. Um, um, Councillor Gesselbrock amended it. It was his motion to start with. He amended it, and there was um, 
um, agreement from the seconder, so and it wasn't. I thought Councillor Armstrong raised her hand to second, but she wasn't the original seconder. Um, no, um, Councillor Martman was the original seconder, and that was who was agreement with. Well, I was in favor then, because I was in favor of the original. We'll add you as the in favors, and the motion is still defeated. But thank you. We're clear? Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you. The next is 285 Prudhoe Street, lease to BC Housing. Mr. Corson again. Thank you, Worship. Mr. Holmes never going to get his well, he's star got, in the he's firm. He's got some fun development tonight. applications for you in just a minute, so I'll, I will be quick. Uh, we're before you tonight to ask for your permission and approval to enter into a 60 year lease with BC Housing for uh, property at 285 Prudhoe Street, owned by the City of Nanaimo, known as the Community Services Building. This uh, building since uh, May has uh, been mostly used by BC Housing to establish what's known as Emergency Response Center uh, for uh, our vulnerable citizens in the city. It's been run by Island Crisis Care. Council granted a license <coughs> at that time until the end of this year. We're asking Council to extend that license to uh, end of June next year, at what time the property will transfer to BC Housing in its entirety and uh, this new supportive housing site on this property will begin construction. The uh, new operator of the supportive housing at this site will be the John Howard Society, and there will be 51 units of supportive housing. We, uh, last couple of weeks, we've been doing public consultation with the neighborhood in terms of the development permit, and that application will likely be formally received by staff early in the new year. And uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Corson. Councillor Brown. Oh, that must nope. just be left on. Left over. Sorry, Councillor Gesselbrock. Left over. Sounds like dinner at the Krogs after Christmas. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I'm, I'm not left over. <laughs> the, um, I would like to just move the two staff recommendations, please. Very good. Second to Councillor Hemmons. Councillor Armstrong. Um, I just have a question if there will be a good neighborhood agreement with the. Um, John Howard in the Old City Quarter, or any other neighborhood association similar to what we have at the other sites? Yeah, through your worship, um, we do set up the community advisory committees with each, uh, within each, and we've already committed to that to each Thank of the you. neighborhood associations. Councillor Gesselbrock? No, still not? I don't know how I keep popping up. Councillor Thorpe? Thank you, your worship. Um, through you, I, I certainly support this uh, and will vote in favor, but a question to satisfy my own curiosity because I didn't see it in the report, maybe I missed it, and that is simply about the term of the lease. Oh. Why 60 years? Uh, is, that, is that standard for some reason or was there a special reason? Yeah, through your worship, Councillor Thorpe. So that's the standard uh, length of term we've done on city properties to BC Housing. So the, uh, the Wesley Street property um, is on a 60-year lease to BC Housing, as is the Uplands property and the uh, Boundary property. And uh, so those revert back to the city after 60 years. Thank you. And I guess I'm, I'm still curious why that number was chosen. That's the number that BC Housing asked us to consider um, back on, our, on the first project, on the Wesley Street project, about 10 years ago. And we've uh, followed, that's the standard term they use, so, yeah. All right, thank you. Councillor Hemmons and Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a quick question. Uh, the John Howard Society is known for doing scattered site housing in our neighbor, or in our community. Is this the first permanent supportive application or um, building that they will run? Uh, uh, this will be the first supportive housing project they run in the city. Yes, they obviously have their Ross Town uh, right. treatment facility, yeah. as well as the that are scattered sites around the city. Right, but 51 units, that's new That's new territory for the John Howard Society, is my understanding. Yeah, through okay. worship, yes, yes it is. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I also had the same question regarding the time frame. I'm guessing that's probably the length of the time they expect the building to last. That's about, sounds about that length of time. Um, in the event that our society gets our act together and we actually don't need this type of building, um, are we able to get the lease back again? Uh, would that just be mutual dis um, mutual decision between two parties at that time? Uh, through your worship, are you referring to if 40 years from now there was no homelessness in the city and the building was no longer required? 
Don't or do you mean after 60 years? <laughs> I, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Hoping. Yes. Um, yeah, at that point, if BC Housing no longer needed the building, um, we could have a negotiation with them and potentially transfer the building back to us and uh, use it for market housing, or they might want to do that themselves. Yeah. Good. Now, they can consent, but we can't force them. And uh, I look forward to that conversation in 40 years from now. Thank you. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? I'm going to assume, Councillor Turley, you're in favor, but I can't see you yet. Um, sorry, Your Worship, we're just having some technical difficulties, so I don't know if Councillor Turley can hear us or not, and if so, he could speak up. Um, but we're having some problems on our Coun side. Councillor Turley, can you hear us? I'm sure it's not a Russian cyber attack anyway. Your Worship, would you mind if we actually maybe had our, our recess time, um, uh, like a five minute recess, so we could see if we could get this straightened out? Because we have some delegations that are on uh, via yes. Zoom as well. So um, could you let's, give us five minutes? Let's take five minutes, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much. My apologies. Our emergency routes, they are priority routes. They consist of roads that go to and from the hospitals, uh, from the fire department stations, and from the BC ambulance stations. They're also their main commerce routes through the city of Nanaimo. So this allows uh, commerce to happen during a snow event. So we hit those roads first. Once those are clear and open, then we move into the secondary roads, and then we move into the residential areas, which are dead end roads and cul-de-sacs. And it can take up to 96 hours before we get into the residential areas. One of the uh, side effects of plowing snow is it does end up on the sidewalk and this can be very frustrating for homeowners and business owners that have just cleaned the sidewalk. Uh, it also pulls into their driveways. The crews try to keep it as close to the curb as they can, but we need to open the road right up to the curb to allow the drains to be exposed for when the snow starts to melt. larger winter maintenance vehicles. They're very versatile in that they can be equipped with a lot of our different pieces of equipment. Right now this one has a front plow, a belly plow, as well as a salter or spreader box. We also have a brine unit that fits into this vehicle. This is the belly plow and it's really good at removing hard packed snow and ice. And then back up here to the front we have what everyone is, is more familiar with. This front plow can push a lot of snow, so make sure that you slow down and keep your distance from the vehicles to ensure safety. We have 17 vehicles that uh, we use within the snow and ice operations for the city of Nanaimo. We also have an early shift that starts at 5 in the morning, and we have a night patrol, an afternoon shift, and an evening shift. They are eyes on the road, keeping us appraised of the conditions so that when the snow starts falling or ice starts farming on the roads, they can start salting and also call for other resources and mobilize the crews out.
This is one of the City of Nanaimo Public Works snow and ice control vehicles. And this is actually set up for a brining unit right now or anti-icing. And what brine is is a 23.3% sodium chloride solution. And uh, it comes out of the spray bars down here at the bottom and it's made here at the Public Works Yard. It's a proactive method of snow and ice control as when we know that there's a winter storm coming, we can actually lay this down on the road prior to the event. By putting the brine down before the snow comes, it, uh, it buys time. It lets us get on the roads and then when we hit it with the plows, it doesn't stick. The snow doesn't stick, it comes off much easier. Whereas if we didn't brine, the snow has an opportunity to freeze to the road. So another benefit of the brining or anti-icing unit is that during the frosty mornings, we can have it drive down the road and then immediately the frost disappears as they're applying the brine. Brine's a great tool for us. It's uh, very cost effective. We can stretch our, our, our hard pressed uh, tax dollars to the maximum. Uh, we can make brine for uh, cents on the dollar. So the other thing that we ask is that everyone stays back from these anti-icing or any winter maintenance vehicles as it's, they have limited visibility and it's poor conditions out there and they're trying to maneuver around everything. So just stay back and give them a little bit of room to operate and clear the roads. So here we are in the public works yard, city of Nanaimo, and uh, what you look around, you can see our various tools that we use for snow and ice fighting. We have uh, tandem trucks, four by four trucks, we have backhoes. All our trucks are capable of having front plows on them, and the larger trucks, we have uh, belly plows on them as well, and they all have a salter sander that can be mounted on the back. This is another tool in our winter maintenance fleet. It's a salting machine. And what happens is that the salt gets loaded into this hopper, and on this conveyor where it gets hit with these two saddle tanks which are full of brine. Then it comes out here on the spreader and why we add the brine is that it reduces the amount of uh, spray from the salt so it doesn't bounce nearly as far saving about 20 to 30 percent of our salt. As well by using the anti-icing liquid on the salt the activation starts right as it hits the road. The purpose of the salt is a to keep the roads bare, keep ice from forming on the road again safety for everyone, including ourselves and the public. Uh, that's why we put the salt down. Council meeting and Ms. Gurry, I gather we've been able to confirm that Councillor Turley voted in favour. Thank you very much, C Council. Councillor Gesselbrock, Councillor Martman, we're, we're back on. If we could all pay some attention. I realize we're coming close to Christmas and the kids are excited, but we do have a meeting to complete and a few things to vote on. So the motion, uh, item E, 285 Prado Street is passed. We are now on to development permit application number DP1150-2517 Bone Road. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, I won't turn this over to Mr. Corson, uh, finally. Um, <laughs> so this, this is a, a project, it's an infill project that's uh, sited at the um, uh, co-op uh, uh, shopping centre at the corner of Labio and Bowen Road, and uh, as you can see overhead there, and um, if you could bring up attachment uh, B, please, it um, shows the location of the site. And it's actually the proposed um, administrative offices for uh, uh, Mid-Island Co-op. And um, so uh, you can see building C there, that's the new building in blue. And um, so that's proposed as the uh, administrative offices for Mid-Island Co-op. And it consists of a four-story office building and it's in the southwest corner of the site, as you can see. It fronts on um, Labio Road. And it's quite a steep site. Um, it's seven meters grade change from uh, the parking area that you see to Labio Road. Um, so it doesn't present as, as uh, four stories uh, in the parking area. They're actually asking for a, a height variance, um, partly to, to address the, the steep grade of the site. And uh, they're asking for a variance from uh, 14 meters, which is permitted in the um, uh, in the uh, core three zone to 17.7 uh, .7 meters. And uh, the upper floor is actually, the building has quite a bit of a generous amount of glazing. And um, if you could bring up attachment E, you can see the, um, please, uh, you can see the um, building design there. So there's quite a generous amount of glazing in the building and the upper floor is uh, stepped back. 
and uh, it's quite a bit lighter, you can see, and, and it's got a, a staff amenity um, patio area there that uh, um, would be nice for staff to be able to take advantage of. Um, the uh, proposal is consistent with the applicable development permit area design guidelines and um, consistent with the zoning other than the uh, proposed height variance. Um, although not included um, uh, as, a, as a requirement for the development permit, um, they're, they're actually, um, as part of this, uh, uh, the co-op is looking at upgrading the site um, more broadly to include uh, improved uh, pedestrian circulation as well as um, some electric vehicle charging stations and uh, in, in improved landscaping for the site overall. So while well, they're focusing on this, this building and that's what the development permits for, there are proposing some additional uh, site improvements. Uh, staff support the proposed variance and um, uh, recommendations are provided in the, in the report and uh, be happy to take any questions if you have any. Any questions, Councillor Bonner? I was just going to move the recommendations, Your Honour. And seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is development permit application number DP1174-2535, Bowen Road. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And this is another site on Bowen Road. It's actually uh, very close proximity to the last uh, application. This is uh, uh, the site of uh, Nanaimo Honda car dealership and it's a redevelopment of, um, of the site uh, that includes, um, uh, this is an application from Island West Coast Development um, and it includes a substantial expansion to the existing dealership. Um, if you could bring up um, uh, attachment uh, B, I guess it demonstrates the, the uh, location of the property there. Um, and. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this proposal includes a variance to uh, a minimum height requirement in the corridor zone. Um, the minimum height requirement is um, uh, two stories. Uh, this building presents as two stories, and if you could bring up the elevations, I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, it presents as two stories, uh, and some of the board, uh, some of the building is actually two stories, uh, but. Um, it doesn't uh, fully comply with the, the two-story requirement of the corridor zone. So there is a, a request to relax uh, uh, the strict requirement for a two-story uh, full building uh, presentation. Um, the proposal is um, an expansion to uh, uh, a uh, 2,200 square meter car dealership from 900 square meters currently. So quite a significant expansion. You can see it's um, uh, provided uh, the, the Honda corporate branding is um, what, what it presents there. And um, the, they're also asking for uh, some minor variances to landscape buffer from uh, 1.8 meters required to zero in, uh, in one uh, location and 1.1 uh, meters in another location. Um, and uh, the staff support the proposed uh, variances and the uh, uh, proposed development permit complies with the applicable development permit area guidelines. Thank you very much. Councillor Hemmons is moving the recommendation. It's seconded Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Bonner, do you have any questions? I do actually, if I may. Um, in our last uh, item that came up, um, there was a green roof and also a, a water um, a rain garden um, from the green roof for any overfill, I'm guessing. On this particular one, there's no green roof and there's only a little tiny rain garden that I can see on the landscape plan. And I'm wondering if, how, how uh, if I could ask a question to uh, staff, how are they dealing with the runoff? Uh, thank you, uh, th through the chair, to Councillor Bonner's question. So yeah, there is, there is a, um, uh, uh, rain garden proposed. Um, they'd be working with uh, their engineer to to address um, uh, the stormwater uh, requirements, the stormwater standards for the development. Um, I'm not sure of the details at this point, but they may come up through building permitting when they're doing the design stage acceptance uh, for the, the engineering civil works design for the project, but they may use underground um, containment. Uh, they will have to meet the minimum uh, stormwater standards uh, that, that we have. Okay, thank you. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Worship. Um, 
This one it was interesting conversation at the design panel. I mean, particularly because, it, like, you look at it and you say, well, that's a car dealership. Um, and there's a point that was raised, and I think it's worth really bringing up, that it talks about corporate building design um, and these cities' design objectives. And I think if you look time and time again, where there's strong corporate branding, like this, car dealerships, gas stations, you can take your pick, there seems to be a lot of pushback against community design, conforming to community design standards. And so I would like to contrast that with, say, something like Longwood, where uh, the Longwood station where, yes, there's a lot of corporate branding, TD, thrifties, and all those sort of things, but you can see a strong, um, and you know, it probably was the willingness of the applicant as well, but a strong intent to conform to community design rather than corporate design. So I think, I'm just flagging this, you know, it was rigged, raised by the design panel, but I think when we look at, well, through the reimagine and I'm on the OCP review process, we need to make our DP stronger so the community's design guidelines aren't so easily pushed back against, uh, or we're not implementing a lot of corporate design that doesn't really be sensitive to the type of uh, urban design that our, I think our community deserves, but also wants articulated through those guidelines. So I just flag that because I, I do want to emphasize that when it comes to the OCP review, that's something I definitely will be looking at. Um, and there's a lot of good examples around Nanaimo and elsewhere where uh, the corporate response has also uh, respected community, community intent. Even Harewood, I think some of the recent development there, it's really nice. So um, this really misses the mark uh, for me. I will be voting against it because it, it unfortunately does meet the design guidelines. Uh, Ms. Gurry, I understood that uh, Mr. Beald and Mr. Andreth wouldn't participate unless questions were asked of them. Is that still the understanding? That's correct. So if there is any question and or um, I suppose if they wanted to comment on, on and or have further information to these comments, they could speak. Mr. DeBeald, Mr. Brandreth, if you have any comment or if council members have any questions for you. All right, no further discussion on this. The motion's been made. All those in favor? Councillors Armstrong, Martman, Hemmett, Kesselbrock, Hemmons, Krogh, Thorpe, Brown, and Bonner, and Turley. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is development permit application number DP1192 4851 Cedar Ridge Place. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this development permit application proposes a 98-unit, uh, um, it's actually a mixed development, but 98-unit uh, multifamily residential. It's proposed as rental. Um, and uh, sorry, that looks like the wrong um, site plan there. If you, It's for Cedar Ridge Place, correct? Oops. Um, anyway, I'll just... Um, carry on just explaining so it's a 98 um, unit multifamily um, development that includes a small uh, um, commercial unit there it is overhead it's on the corner of uh, Cedar Ridge and uh, Rutherford Road and um, it's uh, yeah they're uh, quite um, uh, oh yeah mix of units uh, one and two bedroom units are proposed and again proposed as rental uh, it's within the corridor two zone and um, uh, it's uh, w close, obviously close proximity uh, to Nanaimo uh, North Town Center, the Grand Hotel, uh, you can see adjacent there, and uh, Nanaimo Memory and Complex Care uh, is, in the close, is in close proximity as well. Um, as well, there's an unconstructed multifamily development at 4800 Cedar Ridge, well, sorry, under construction at 48 Cedar, 4800 Cedar Ridge, um, 172 units as well. Um, as well, uh, a previously approved development at um, 4979 Wills Road, 160 seniors unit, uh, mixed development, uh, close proximity is in for building permit. Um, this, uh, the, this subject property is uh, obviously close proximity to transit, uh, shopping, um, commercial services, as well as uh, public amenities, including Long Lake and um, um, pedestrian uh, pathway in uh, Lakeview uh, Drive there. Um, 
the um, design is uh, contemporary, um, and if you could pull up attachment F, please, you'll see a, an example of the design. Um, the upper corners uh, at the end units are recessed um, to, to reduce uh, building massing, and uh, there's a, a common patio area provided uh, as well on the upper floor. Um, they're asking for a, a small rear yard uh, setback relaxation from 7.5 to 5.66 meters, and that's partly to um, allow them to uh, site the building to retain a rock outcrop. They're asking for a relaxation to the percentage of the uh, front face of the building that must meet the setback along Rutherford Road. Um, and uh, the, the proposed reduction is from 50% required to 32%. Although um, they're not meeting the 50% requirement, the commercial building does provide uh, good frontage on Rutherford Road as well. There's a, um, an active uh, a plaza area below and, uh, and in front of the um, commercial space there. They're also asking for a building height variance from 18 meters to 20.5 meters. And uh, you can see this, the site is quite uh, steeply sloped. Um, so they're uh, trying to uh, address the grade. Um, so a relatively small height variance and uh, as well trying to minimize rock removal. And then one other small variance um, uh, or minor variance, I guess, is a refuse enclosure uh, setback variance from three meters to 0.3 meters. Um, it'll be well screened still by landscaping and uh, a rock um, outcrop on the adjacent property. So no, no negative uh, um, impacts anticipated a result, as a result of any of the variances there. Um, otherwise, the uh, proposal is consistent with the zoning and development permit area design guidelines. Happy to take any questions if you have any. Councillor Armstrong, you have some questions before? Yeah, it's actually things. more of a comment uh, because my uh, issue is not with the uh, what we're discussing, but I do have some major concerns about the traffic flow on there. Are we looking at putting a light in there because that's already a high accident area and adding that many more vehicles onto that street without a light is just fatal after fatal. It's already a blind curve as you come around there and uh, so many close calls, so many fender benders. So I know we're not discussing that. I'll be in voting in favor of the, the things, but I just wanted to flag that, that it should be something that we should be looking at with all those new developments going in there. Thank you. Councillor Bonnie. Thank you, Worship. Um, this is a, a bit different than the project just up at the other end of the street uh, in, um, in terms of I think the amenities that they're uh, creating, including that other project is doing solar panels, roofs, they're, they're trying to get uh, one of their buildings at net zero. I'm um, not really seeing that in this one, but they don't have to, and I appreciate that. Um, my question is regarding the variance on the height, it's because of the slope. So if the, if the, pro if the property was level, they'd only be able to go a certain height without asking for variance. So we've given them a variance, which means they're getting more space. It's the slope down, I guess. So what does, what value does that uh, represent? Or, or not, it may be hard to question to answer, but like, do we have an idea on, on what uh, value that creates uh, or increases the, the property for, for, for that particular building? Like, are they able to put more uh, residential units in there? Are they gonna use it for parking? Thank you, yeah, uh, through your worship, if you could bring up attachment E, please. It actually shows the, um, uh, the red line um, through the drawing. It'll show the uh, allowable height versus the proposed height. You can see it there. Um, oh, yeah, any one of those will do. But you can see, so what the height variance is providing, I guess, effectively. Um, I, I couldn't comment on um, what, what the value is. They could probably, design the site differently to come up with to, to come up with the same amount of building area um, this is just a I guess a more probably a more efficient uh, form uh, to go up a little bit higher rather than than spread it out um, and uh, yeah they are they are dealing with um, uh, some significant uh, grade change on the site actually if, um, I think you can see it better if you go up one more page um, yeah there you go you can see the grade change on the site is fairly significant. Um, 
So I, I sorry, I can't speak. I can't comment on on the value that they would be uh, receiving from this. But we look at it from a design consideration and and context, and and um, would in this case recommend in favor of the variance. Thank you, Councillor Turley. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just trying to figure out um, from the drawings where the entrance to the what I assume is underground parking. Sorry, did you hear me? Yes, thank you. I, yeah, thank you. I did. I'm just looking for um, uh, the site. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, so if um, if we could bring up attachment D, I think it probably shows it best. There's actually there are actually two entrances. And if you uh, if you can see there near the um, the CRU, the the small commercial unit, you can see an entrance to the underground parking there. And as well, um, towards the end of the cul-de-sac, you can see an entrance there as well. So it's off of, off of Cougar Ridge, right? Off Cedar Ridge, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Cedar Ridge, sorry, yeah. That's right. Okay, good. Thank you. Can we move the, move the recommendation? Councillor Hemmins, seconded Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, motion carries, thank you. The next is development variance permit application number DVP 406-164 Holland Road. Mr. Holm. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. This, um, uh, this application is uh, for a variance to allow an increase to the um, maximum permitted uh, floor area for an accessory building. And uh, the property is on Holland Road, um, as you can see there. Um, the property is zoned AR2, and it's uh, urban reserve. It's in an area that's uh, rural, residential, agricultural in nature, um, and uh, so characterized by rural acreages and agricultural uses. Uh, the property is quite large. It's around 8,500 square meters. Uh, the proposed variance is to allow a, um, an accessory building of uh, 243 square meters. Uh, whereas uh, a maximum of 90 square meters or 13% um, of the, the parcel area, uh, the maximum of, um, sorry, that the, uh, the lesser of 90 square meters or 13% of the parcel area is what's permitted under the zoning. Um, they're also asking for a minor height variance from 7 meters to 7.85 meters. Uh, so, as I mentioned, accessory buildings are, per, are limited currently to 90 square meters or 13% of the parcel area. Uh, what's proposed given the size of the parcel is actually um, at 243 square meters, the accessory building is still only 2.8% uh, of the parcel area, so quite small relative to the parcel given the rural setting. Um, the proposed accessory building is also well separated from uh, neighboring homes and would be consistent with um, uh, the rural character of the area, the agricultural character of the area. Uh, staff support the proposed variances and um, happy to take any questions. Councillor Hemmins is moving the recommendation. Is there a seconder? Councillor Bonner, any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary? Motion carries. Thank you. The next is development variance permit application number DVP 409-3358 Stevenson Point Road. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Another variance related to an accessory building, uh, this time on a large uh, property, our one zone property on Stevenson, Stevenson Point Road. It's um, east of the Pacific Biological Station. Um, if you could pull up attachment B, it'll show the, um, please, it'll show the, the context of uh, yeah, there it is, so relative to the biological station. And then if you could pull up attachment E, it'll show the, um, the height variance. Thank you. So they're asking for a minor height variance of um, uh, 0 0.31 meters. And uh, this um, application was, uh, the, or this property was previously the topic of a development variance permit to increase the gross floor area allowed for an accessory building. Um, when they came in for uh, a building um, permit application, 
uh, they identified that they were uh, 0.31 meters, uh, a little more than one foot uh, over height uh, relative to what's allowed uh, in the zoning. Um, you can see the red line shows the, uh, the allowable uh, uh, versus the, the proposed. Um, it is, a, again, a sloping site. Um, it can be challenging to uh, accurately determine uh, building height until uh, a surveyor is involved and uh, uh, the building permit demonstrated that uh, they need a height variance to proceed as proposed. So happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Hemmons moves the motion. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, motion carries, thank you. The next is development variance permit application number DVP 41054 uh, Mild May Road. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is uh, a request to relax a flanking side yard setback uh, from four meters to 1.5 meters for a property that's located on Brannan Lake and uh, addressed on Mild May Road. Uh, the property is RS1 zoned and um, is uh, adjacent to an unconstructed road right of way that you can see there. Um, the uh, proposed variance would allow for a larger building envelope uh, for a proposed single family dwelling and uh, attached garage. Um, again, the proposed variance is from 4 meters to 1.5 meters. Uh, no negative in, uh, impact is anticipated to the uh, proposed unconstructed uh, road right of way or adjacent uh, parcels. And uh, 1.5 meters is generally consistent with a, um, a, a standard side yard setback for uh, uh, an adjacent single family property. Happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Councillor Hemmons moving in motion. Councillor Bonner seconding. Just a quick question. So that is a part of uh, Avro Way that takes us down to the lake, right? The unconstructed road right away? Uh, that's correct. And we own that? Correct. Why don't we sell it? Oh, sorry. No, the property is not. Uh, the um, the property is uh, is privately held. We own the um, the city owns the road right of way that you can see extending from Avro to uh, Brandon Lake. That that's what I'm getting at. We we own the chunk of Avro Way down to Brandon Lake. Correct. Yeah. Just oh, why don't we sell it? Is is the question? Yes. I'm not asking you to answer it. I'm just okay. Yeah, uh, there, it's an access to water uh, provided through subdivision as a requirement of subdivision, and um, it's uh, yeah, it provides uh, it provides access to the lake. Right now, it's uh, it's undeveloped, uh, but it could be used uh, maybe used by residents in the area to access water, um, and uh, it could be developed uh, in the future to provide uh, an improved access to water. Won't make the people in the neighborhood happy, but I'm just looking at a valuable lakefront lot and thinking of all the property we may wish to acquire in the city that uh, would have more uh, more public use. I'll leave it at that. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is Covenant Amendment Application Number CA14-6010 Brickyard Road. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is uh, the site of uh, the Brickyard uh, Medical Clinic. Um, it's, uh, it was um, rezoned in 1989 and a covenant was uh, uh, placed on title that restricted uh, use on the property despite the zoning to uh, medical offices with optional drug dispensary facilities and lab facilities. So focused on the, the Brickyard Medical Clinic at that time. Um, the current owner would like to uh, have the covenant uh, discharged and has applied to do so. Um, well, it's entitled the covenant amendment application, the amendment would be to discharge the covenant. Um, that's what's been requested. If uh, this were approved, um, the property is currently zoned core three, corridor three, and uh, uh, the, the full range of uses under the core three zone would be provided for uh, with the release of the covenant, the discharge of the covenant. Um, that's what's being asked for tonight, though, is just to uh, consider advancing that application to uh, public hearing, and um, and then there would be opportunity for public further public input at that point. Um, I should mention that the official community plan designation, obviously, a lot's changed since 1989, um, in, including the zoning on the property um, as well. The official community plan designation is uh, corridor. 
and um, which uh, would support the range of uses uh, proposed in the in the core three zone. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but yeah, what's being asked tonight is to advance the application to uh, public hearing uh, for further opportunity for public input. Thanks. Moved, Councillor Hammond, seconded, Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Gesselbrock, no, Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm just curious, what was the rationale behind putting a covenant on for a medical building only? Um, seems a bit weird. Uh, I would imagine um, back in the in the time there, in 1989, uh, there may have been some concern about uh, um, other other uses on the property, and in order to, I would imagine it was probably residential zoned back then, and uh, um, the there may have been concern about other uses on the property at that point. Um, so there was a commitment at the time to to. Uh, enter into uh, a covenant to limit the uses. Their interest at that time was in a medical facility. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the planning policies in the city have changed uh, since that point as well. Um, the corridor zoning didn't exist. Um, this would have been, you know, largely a well-established residential area at that time. Um, and uh, I would imagine there could have been some concern around uh, other uses uh, that might have been allowed in the zone without the covenant. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much. Ms. Gurry, I note the time. I'm in council's hands. We have a scheduled recess. Or should we carry on? Carry on. I like it. The next is bylaws. Councillor Hemmons, the first one, sewer regulation and char char charge amendment bylaw 2020 number 2496.33. decimal Thank you, Your Worship. I move that sewer regulation and charge <coughs> amendment bylaw 2020 number 2496.33 to set the 2021 rates for sanitary sewer be adopted. Second to Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any contrary? Motion carries. Uh, the next is Waterworks Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2020, number 7004.16. Thank Councilor you. Hemmings. I move that Waterworks Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2020, number 7004.16, to set the 2021 water rates be adopted. Second to Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any contrary? Motion carries. The next is User Fee Subsidies Amendment Bylaw 2020, number 7095.02. Thank you. I move that user fee subsidies amendment bylaw 2020 number 7095.02 to set the 2021 thresholds for user, user fee subsidies be adopted. Second to Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is Southwest Bulk Water Rate Amendment Bylaw 2020 number 7099.09. Thank you. I move that Southwest Bulk Water Rate Amendment Bylaw 2020, number 7099.09, .09, to set the 2021 bulk water rates for Southwest Extension be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favour? Any contrary? Motion carries. Thank you. The next is Municipal Solid Waste Collection Amendment Bylaw 2020, number 7128.12. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. I move that Municipal Solid Waste Collection Amendment Bylaw 2020, number 7128.12, to update the bylaw to set rates for 2021 be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Martman. All those in favour? Any contrary? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, bylaw Notice Amendment, uh, pardon me, Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment uh, Bylaw 2020, number 7159.09. I move that bylaw notice enforcement amendment bylaw 2020 number 7159.09 housekeeping amendment to correct reference to section 6.9 within the by building bylaw section of schedule a be adopted Second. seconded councillor martman all those in favor opposed motion carries the bylaw status sheet is for information only ms gurry we have no notices of motion uh, under other business. Um, we have two items. The first is correspondence dated 2020 November 30th from the BC Ombudsperson Office quarterly report. Uh, we don't need a motion for that, it's just being received. And Councillor Hemmons, you had... 
Thank you. So just a process question. We, um, we've put the, the letter from members of the Homeless Coalition into other business, so now I just make the motion related to the letter. Um, thank you, Worship. Yes, that's correct. So it will be added as a supplemental item, and it's on the screen here now, and business arising from it, which would be your motion, it would be appropriate to make that now. Great, thank you. And I just want to, in my earlier um, words, noted that this was a letter from the coalition, but I've um, reviewed it. It's actually not, so I've changed the, the wording slightly, and it's that I move to refer the letter received from numer numerous social service providers to the office of the CAO to coordinate a stakeholder meeting inclusive, uh, inclusive of the health and housing co-chairs pursuant to the requests made. Second. Seconded, Councillor Martman. Any discussion? Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Um, one thing I would like, we've had, it relates to this, and that's community questions around water facilities and toilets. And um, I will, uh, um, actually, I'm going to save that. I'm not sure where I'm meant to. We had discussed earlier having that information provided on the city website. Is that, is that something that we can do without a motion? OK, great. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, motion carries. Councillor Hammonds, you'd asked earlier if you could have a minute or two before we close the meeting to comment on a couple well, of items. Sure, I'm it's being like indulgent. Late, but I, just, I, I did want to say, you know, on, a, on an agenda where we had the recognition of a, a program and federal funding to support young women entering into leadership roles and then having our fire chief go off to Vancouver, I think um, it was probably 50 or 60 years ago that all of the women in this room would have been someone else's secretary. And it's because I think, well, I think well, it, happy it's, Hall it's, here then. <laughs> it's women like Chief Fry and Councillor Armstrong like you in the force and Councillor Martman like you being a single mom and a politician. Um, I think it's... Every, everybody works towards um, bringing women up and, and having them in leadership roles, all, all women, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or you're working or whatever. But there are, there are some women that punch above their weight, and I think Chief Fry is a really good example of that. So um, it's a little late, but I did want to acknowledge that because of work and the position that she holds, she's actually a beacon for a lot of young women. So yeah, my gratitude for her. Well said. So we're just at the time for a motion for adjournment, and I'm sure somebody, all of you might want to say something as it's Christmas. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship, and I, I'd like to thank you for earlier um, acknowledging that today is the winter solstice, um, and that while it is the, uh, the shortest day of the year, uh, it is also a, uh, a, a cultural event that is celebrated by Indigenous populations all around the world. And, and um, last night, um, Crimson Coast and a number of organizations put on a fabulous event online uh, with many people around the world, literally around the world, participating uh, in that event. And I look forward to, uh, you know, sometime in the near future, uh, this being a, an annual holiday or something along those lines. And, and thank you, Councillor Hammonds, for your comments regarding uh, women and the need for more uh, more icons and more mentors and, and more um, uh, role models. You know, I think it's very important that we go do that gets done. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Change of the Days from short to hopefully a little longer. Um, it uh, has been quite the year, and uh, I don't think I need say more. I said a lot earlier. I'm appreciative of having you all here and. Um, we just ask for uh, the blessings of the season on uh, everyone, including family members of this council and all others. So thank you. Motion to adjourn, please. Motion. Councillor Martman, seconded Councillor Gesselbrock. All those in favor? Thank Merry you very Christmas. much. Merry Christmas. <laughs>